everybody to get to know this wonderful woman. I said it last night, but let me say it again. Uh, she contacted the people in Wales, you know, the Reese House people, and um, they, they told her about Polly's Island because uh, uh, Lindsay Griffiths was going to come to Polly's Island. Well, it ended up she didn't come, but this precious woman did come, and she's just been just she's just been a blessing to us there. And she uh, was teaching Reese House intercession intercessor. She was teaching this before she ever read anything of Norman Grubb. And she was teaching it in her church. She's a fabulous teacher. You're going to get a lot out of her. But then she, then she got a hold of Norman's stuff, and it's turned her whole self, her whole life around. And there, her church, it's catching on fire in her church. That, I'm saying that it's a prophetic thing to say. You said there's only 10 people. 10 people in a whole church that uh, is catching the truth of union with Christ? Wow, that's a phenomenon. That just doesn't happen. So the Holy Spirit, you know, is is using you and Fred, her precious husband Fred, to um, love on these people and bring them alive in the truth of who they are and get filled with the Spirit. Now the bad, they're Baptists and they're... Um, they're recognizing the Holy Spirit. The, pre the preacher has been saying, oh my gosh, the Baptists have neglected the Holy Spirit all these years. So that's the introduction on dead fire. So how many of you have read Reese Howell's Intercessor? <clears throat> okay. How many of you read it more than once? I'm halfway through the Okay. Um, I hope I can do this sitting down. I'm, I'm a rather lively person, so if I have to pop up, he'll just have to move the camera and kind of follow me. <laughs> but um, how many of you have taught classes on the book, The Intercessor? Well, you know, I read about Reese Howells about 15 or 20 years ago, and I don't recall who introduced me to the book, but I do recall the impact that it had on my life. And I knew one thing, I wanted to be like that man. Not that I saw myself living the kind of life as a man of prayer or a woman of prayer, but rather that I wanted to be that close to my Lord and that sensitive to the Holy Spirit. At the age of 10, I accepted Christ as my personal Savior. As the teachers always put it, I asked Jesus to live in my heart. And it happened on a, after Sunday school one Sunday, and all the classes would gather together for the closing <coughs> song. And when we came to the line, I've got the peace that passes understanding down in my heart, I couldn't keep singing. I was only 10, but I knew that I didn't have peace. I woke up the next day so excited. Today is the day I would get peace. I told Jesus I was ready and he could give it to me anytime. <laughs> well, before the day was over, something upsetting had happened and I was plunged into inner turmoil. But I forgave God, and I said, that's okay. I know you have a lot to do, Jesus, and a lot of people to take care of, so if you want to give it to me tomorrow, that's okay. And I kept saying the same thing over and over, and the disruptive events came and went for weeks, and then for months, and then for years. But I never doubted that he would give it to me. You see, somehow I had figured out that you either believe God or you don't. And if you don't, then you'd be calling God a liar. I had found three verses that had become the cornerstones of my life. And these verses held me up during the wait. Philippians 4, 7 said, And the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. This verse said that my heart and my thoughts would be guarded once I had the peace of God. Although it didn't tell me how to get that peace, I clung to it because it was clear that it was possible to obtain it. And Ephesians 3.16 said that he that would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through the spirit in the inner man. And this verse promised that I had the strength I needed if I had spirit power in the inner man. So I prayed for that inner man all the time to become strong. 
Then when I got strong, I'd get peace. For surely peace was one of God's glorious riches. I found Hebrews 11:6, But without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Well, at last I was doing something right. If there was one thing I was doing, it was diligently seeking him. And there was another thing I had figured out, as since he wasn't giving peace to me, there must be something I was doing or not doing that was keeping me from getting it. Although I was always filled with the feeling of never quite getting it right and never being quite good enough, it was not Romans 7 that puzzled me. It was the dilemma of Hebrews 3 and 4, of entering and not entering the rest. A few of the verses were, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. For we have... We which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I've sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. And to this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying, to David today, after so long a time as it said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, for if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remains therefore rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall in the same example of unbelief. Well, how confusing was this now? That was the brick wall for me. So some get it, some don't, some believe, some don't. Cease from working, but keep working to enter the rest. Okay then, what didn't I believe that was keeping me from this place of rest? And furthermore, what wasn't I believing that I should be believing that would lead me into this place of rest? Why couldn't I live this life in peace? Why couldn't I get it right? It was never good enough, and I wanted it to be. I had become convinced that if I only tried harder to, to prove to him how much I loved him and believed him, that others would be blessed by my trying, and I would have peace. This search led me through the breathtaking ups and downs of a boat tossed on the sea, and I hugged the rails and hoped my anchor would hold through the, through the rod, and it was a long one. A determined girl can accomplish a lot of good works in 52 years. I had a list as long as your arm. I was determined to prove how much I loved God. Through those years of service, I suffered great loss, great inner pain, great disappointment, and I cried out, why? By this time, I was totally disillusioned, not with my Savior, but with the saved. Not particularly the individual believer, but throw them all together in a church, and although the holy fire wasn't lit, the spark sure flew. <laughs> so they were no help. Most of the time, the church was the source of all my heartache. Mm -hmm. That's right. So you see, truthfully, I envied Reese's life. Not in the sense that I wanted to live that kind of life, but I resented that he was so young when he gained all this spiritual insight and that he was used so mightily. I was envious because <clears throat> his inner battles seemed to have lasted only a few years. After that, he lived life at peace. Oh, there were storms, but he didn't seem to notice them. He had entered that ever-elusive resting place. He was courageous and steadfast, and above all, he stubbornly believed God. I longed for this. I longed for what this man had. How would I find it? I read the book a second time about five years later, and then I read it a third time in 2012. In January of 2013, I was a student at in the pastor's Sunday school class at Fraley Memorial Baptist Church in Gastonia, North Carolina. And I would from time to time, as certain topics came up, refer to something in Reese Howe's life that had impacted me in that area. 
One day out of the blue, the Sunday school superintendent's wife, who was also in the class, asked me if I'd be willing to teach that book. I was really caught off guard. I mean, how do you teach a biography? How do I teach about a life that I could only admire but not understand? But there it was. I realized I just said something out loud, and it was, I would be happy to teach about this man's life, of course. What had I just done? What had just happened? Only the greatest thing since I accepted Christ 52 years before. <clears throat> so where to begin? I had to find out why Reese House could live this kind of life. So I decided that since Norman Grubb had written the book, then perhaps I could get some insight from something else he may have written. I had contacted the college, but I really wasn't getting the information that I wanted to get. Well, Yes I Am appeared, and yes I did. <laughs> As I read page after page and chapter after chapter, not only did the principles of Reese's life come alive, they came alive in me. For days and weeks, I kept yelling at my husband, come here, you've got to listen to this. This is it. This is what I've been looking for. I saw it. I saw it. All those verses that I had seen through a dark glass were now crystal clear. You see, I had peace with God. I had peace from God. I had the peace of God. But I just never had peace with myself. I figured it out. I could never have peace with the dead man. <laughs> I had to go to my own gravesite and reckon myself dead. And when I walked away from that tombstone, I was a new creation. And I wanted everyone to have the revelation I had. I wanted everyone to find this peace and rest. I couldn't wait to start teaching intercessor. I began paralleling the books chapter after chapter Norman's union life was Reese's union life. My blind spot just disappeared as I saw that I could overlay one book with the other. I had no idea what I was doing, but for 26 weeks, I taught two books at once. And the scales that had fallen from my eyes began to fall from some of the 16 people in the class. The most precious words of all to me had become, I see it, I see it. I had come upon the life of Reese Howes knowing that there was more. I had been a diligent seeker for that missing piece for 52 years. So I was ready for it when it fell into my lap. But all but one or two of these people didn't even know there was more. Most thought they knew all they needed to know. What else could there be? They didn't know what it was that they didn't know that they didn't know. Without being blasphemous, I have many times felt that Norman's hand was surely divinely guided and inspired in the way he tells Reese's story. I could read that book ten more times and find another principle being worked out in his life to teach on that I hadn't seen before. The brilliant and subtle way in which Dr. Grubb weaves the precious ways of God's dealing with man to conform him to his own image is what truly makes Reese Howe's life come alive. You must do more than read this book. You must literally excavate this book. You must dig and dig and dig some more. For under the rocks lie hidden treasures, and to miss them is to miss much of the story. So who was Reese Howes, and why is his story still changing lives today? What was so special about this man? <coughs> Absolutely nothing. Nothing at all. And in that lies the specialness. He's so much like any one of us that we feel drawn into his thoughts and feelings, his doubts and determination, his simplicity and his complexity, his tears and his laughter, his blunders and his victories become ours. Although his life events were unique, to say the least, his spiritual journey is so like any ordinary man's that he becomes a sort of touchstone for us. We can see ourselves in Reese Howes. He was born in February of 1879 to a poor but godly church-going family. He was the sixth of 11 children, and he certainly excelled in putting on the things of Christ. He wore them outwardly 
and by his own description of himself, he felt that he was, quote, overshadowed by the presence of God from birth and was by nature a good person. Hmm. I actually don't think Reese suffered from guilt and condemnation a whole lot. He was really quite satisfied with himself. His father's work at the iron works and then the coal mines was the family's only source of income. And later he opened a shoe shop and as the children became of age to work at 13, they left school and most of them went to work in the tin mill. We can imagine Reese's uh, good boy consciousness, of impatient to grow up quickly and be a man and contribute to the family. So, at age 12, he went to work at the tin mill off the clock and worked there 12 hours a day for 10 long years. Weary with this drudgery, he decided he would not be like his brothers and everyone else in this sleepy little town, that would make, but he would make his fortune in America. When he prepared to leave for America, he was feeling that God was in his heaven and all was right in the little world of Reese House. In America, he now had a good job, and he continued to live an outwardly holy life. He was sincerely offended by worldly amusements and refused to even attend the theater or sporting events. These were so beneath his self-righteous self that he just could not condescend to be seen there. He went to visit his cousin Evan, Evan Lewis, who lived in the same town he was working in, and Evan flat out asked Reese, are you born again? Reese was insulted by the very suggestion that he wasn't good enough in God's eyes. Evan was no better than he was. But later on, when Evan's sister was dying and spoke to Reese about needing a savior, he began to feel a little bit of conviction. This feeling of being on holy ground scared him, and he decided to stay away lest he should, as he put it, touch the forbidden thing. He even took a job in another town, but he couldn't shake this wondering what it all meant. The author, Norman Grubb, states that it was never explained in a way Reese could understand it. Living such an upright life like that, how could God bring him to the realization that he was born in sin and needed to be saved? Just like men today use the excuse that Christians are hypocrites, Reese did too. He reasoned that since he saw little change in born-again men, he felt quite safe in being convinced that he would never meet a man who lived the Sermon on the Mount. But he promised himself that if he ever did, he'd give in. He had read Henry Drummond's very long and thought-provoking tome entitled Natural Law in a Spiritual World. He saw that everything in nature corresponded with its environment, but not him. <coughs> Through this book, he saw that he didn't correspond with God. He believed in him, but he wasn't fitting into God's environment, and he certainly wasn't born of him. Next, we begin to see God's way of conforming a man to his image. When a man is down, he can only look up. <coughs> Reese developed typhoid fever. He was all alone and far from home. His fear of entering eternal darkness without God, without Christ, entered his soul and overwhelmed him. He, like many have done, struck a bargain with God for a second chance. I'll give my life to you, he cried out. Just let me live. Reese recovered, but although he had been delivered from death, he wasn't delivered from the fear of death. He searched daily for five months for the way to God, even taking the 100-mile trip to visit his cousin again. But still, he wasn't able to make him understand. He moved to Connellsville, Pennsylvania, where he went to hear a converted Jewish man named Maurice Rubin speaking at a Methodist meeting. Maurice talked about the sufferings of Christ for him. As Reese listened, he began to see a man who did live up to the Sermon on the Mount. He saw a man whose family had committed him to a mental institution because he heard the Lord speak to him. He saw a man who sacrificed his share of the quite sizable Jewish family fortune to live a life that wholly and completely followed his master. He saw a man whose wife left him because he had become a Christian. He saw a man who insisted on living by faith alone 
and would not take a regular job. He saw a man who even stood firm when his wife returned with the son he had never seen and said she would come back if only he got a regular job. Reese had realized after his near-death experience that he had only followed a historical Jesus, a factual Jesus, and not a personal savior. And he was not like Maurice Rubin. He didn't have that something that this man had. But now, after Mr. Rubin described the sacred scenes of the cross, Reese cried for hours. He saw that the sacrifice that Jesus made was indeed for him. He saw Christ taking that death for him. Now it was personal. Now he too heard God speak. Will you accept me? Yes, he replied. And from that moment, he was born into another world. It was the love of God, that self-giving love, that couldn't be compared to any love of any other person he knew, that flooded his being. It was that love that broke him. His first thought was to witness to his own folk at home in Wales who had nurtured him in the things of God, his parents and grandparents and his Uncle Dick. But within a few days, all of his ambition and dreams of being well off were about to be realized. He was offered a well-paying job, and he was one yes from making some real money. When the offer came, it was a sharp temptation on the point of his previous weakness, the love of money. So he left as quickly as he could. His new life was coming alive in him, and he was rapidly pushing out the old. Well, until this point in the story, my students were having no trouble relating to the steps that Reese went through in finding the personal Christ. But from here on, they would be introduced to the more. They, along with Reese, were going to discover the depths and the heights of God. They were going to meet up front and personal the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Not just the factual Holy Spirit, but the very real and very personal Holy Spirit. The identity they had in Christ that had been cultivated through years of good Baptist preaching and teaching was about to be upended. I was raised on the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. I heard it a hundred times. Really? There's more? What do you mean, there's more? How would they respond? I had deacons and former adult Sunday school teachers and the Sunday school superintendent in my class. But fools soar where eagles never dare, so onward and upward I went. But let me continue. Arriving back in Wales in 1904, he was determined to never work in that tin mill again. So he took a job in the face of the coal mine. The hardest job there was, even that was better than the tin mill. Norman writes, it was the time of the great revival and his own recent experience just fitted him to take part in it. The Holy Spirit was showing his power. Souls were being saved, but as the enthusiasm died, they were falling away. Reese and his friends blamed themselves because there were no teachers or intercessors to combat the enemy of the new convert souls. They had the joy and the assurance of eternal life, but not the power. At the Landog Wells Convention, he heard Reverend Evan Hopkins spoke, speak on the Holy Spirit, and he made it plain that before he comes to live in a man, he must be given full possession of his body. As he spoke, Reese said, the Holy Ghost appeared to me. It had never dawned on me before that he was a person exactly like the Savior, and that he must come and dwell in flesh and blood. I'd only thought of him as an influence coming on meetings, and that was most of us in the revival thought. I'd never seen that he must live in bodies, as the Savior lived in his body on earth. The meeting with the Holy Ghost was just as real to Reese House as the meeting with the Savior those years before. I saw him as a person apart from flesh and blood, and he said to me, as the Savior had a body, so I dwell in the cleansed temple of the believer. I am a person, I am God, and I'm come to ask you to give your body to me, that I may work through it. I need a body for my temple, but it must belong to me without reserve, for two persons with different wills can never live in the same body. Will you give me yours? But if I come in, 
I come as God, and you must go out. I shall not mix myself with yourself. He made it very plain that he would never share my life. I saw the honor he gave me in suffering to indwell me, but there were many things very dear to me, and I knew he wouldn't keep one of them. The change he would make was very clear. It meant every bit of my fallen nature was to go to the cross, and he would bring in his own life and his own nature. It was unconditional surrender. From the meeting, Reese went out to a field where, again, he cried his heart out. Because as he said, I had received a sentence of death as really as a prisoner in the dark. I had lived in my body for 26 years, and could I easily give it up? Who could give his life up to someone else in an hour? It took Reese five days to make the decision. During those days, Reese was told that things that would be permissible for ordinary men would not be permissible for him. The process of sanctification had begun, and the Spirit was very clear and concise in dealing with the areas that had to be surrendered. The most tenacious area that was to be tested again and again over the next three years was this issue of money. Reese liked money. And he was ambitious, and both had to go. He could never have a choice in making a home. He could never give his life to another person to live to that one alone. He must take the place of others who were suffering and suffer with them and for them. He must endure being viewed a failure. He must give up his reputation. He must stand against his family. Back when standing up to your family, your parents was really respected and difficult to do. He must never compete with another to keep a position. Reese stated that the Holy Ghost took me gr through grade after grade. The process of changing one's nature, replacing the self-nature by the divine nature, was very slow and bitter. It was a daily dying and showing forth the life of Christ. But that life was the life of a victim. Christ was the greatest victim on one side of the cross but the greatest victor on the other. The daily path was the only way of the cross. Every selfish motive and every selfish thought was at once dealt with by the Holy Spirit. He says that in my boyhood days, the strictest man I knew was my schoolmaster, but how often I said that the Holy Ghost was a thousand times more strict. The schoolmaster could only judge by actions, but the Holy Ghost was judging by the motive. Yet every one of the areas that Reese suffered through was a harsh but loving preparation for the life that God had planned for him. Through Reese's experience, I had come to see that the Holy Spirit, as our most intimate friend, will many times, if not most of the time, give us a little glimpse in some way or another of what he has coming for us. For the next three years, Reese was given on-the-job training by physically interceding for others. There were three parts to these intercessory, intercessory assignments. He would be given a very specific assignment. Each assignment cost him something, and each had a definite completion. At the point of completion, a new position was gained, a new victory over the self-life, a victory won not just for the sake of that one battle, but a victory to be walked in from then on. He even had to return to the dreaded tin mill and hang out with a bum every day named Will Battery. He had to pay the debts of a drunk named Jim Stakes, pay to settle a court case against another man. He had to reach the ringleader of the drunk women in town only through prayer. He had to promise to provide for the villagers' needs during a minor strike. He would have to feed and clothe the tramps, promise to care for four orphan children, give up all rights to his money, and give up his ministry to another man. He'd have to pray and labor through until he rose to belief for miraculous healings. Through all of this, he attended cottage meetings every night and he worked over 10 hours a day in the coal mine. <coughs> After giving up the ministry and all of that activity and good works, the Lord began to lead him 
into the hidden life. The Spirit directed him to do some odd things to learn absolute obedience. He endured the side looks of his family members questioning his sanity as he refused to do anything but go to work and spend hours alone in his room in prayer. He refused his mother's food while fasting, refused to wear a hat, secretly took the Nazarite vow, and refused to shave or cut his hair. And he wasn't allowed to tell anybody what was going on. He was embarrassed as he walked to and from work with his long, unruly hair and beard. He looked like a bum himself. He couldn't even hide under a hat. All this suffering and humiliation is the way of the Lord in a man, is it not? Oswald Chambers put it this way in my utmost for his highest. It's in the place of humiliation that we find our true worth to God. Mm -hmm. That's where our faithfulness is revealed. With most of us, these sufferings just come upon us. I have a real challenge because everybody's nodding off. They're all full with, with their lunch. <laughs> with most of us, these sufferings come upon us. But the biggest difference is that Reese's sufferings were all voluntary. Think about that. He clearly saw what he was being asked to suffer before he agreed. He willingly, although not without struggle, invited these things into his life. They were like unchosen and unwelcome guests that we can't get rid of. Sort of like the dreadful arrival of an irritating relative that overstayed his welcome from the door. Suffering, humiliation, and despair. It's the only way for a man to enter into and retain his presence. It's the only way for him to get and retain ours. Reese was somewhat prepared to handle all of this from having read the writings of Madame Jean Guyon, who so aptly stated, O oh, poor soul, what art thou become? Formerly thou wast the delight of thy bridegroom, when he took such pleasure in adorning and beautifying thee. Now thou art so naked, so ragged, so poor, that thou dares neither to enter to look upon thyself nor to appear before him. Those who gaze upon thee, who after having so much admired thee, see thee now so disfigured, believe that either thou hast grown mad, or that thou hast committed some great crime which has caused thy beloved to abandon thee. They do not see that this jealous husband desires that his bride should be his alone. In the abundance of her wealth, she takes delight in contemplating herself. She sees good qualities in herself which engage her affection and alienate her from her bridegroom. O oh, jealous love! How well is it that thou comest to chastise this proud one and to take from her what thou hast given, that she may learn to know herself, and that being naked and destitute, nothing may impede her course. Several times, Reese was so overwhelmed and despairing of this life that he wanted to turn back, but God always pulled him through. After all that he had promised to surrender three years earlier, after all of that had indeed been stripped from him, God began to hand Reese back to himself. His reflection mirrored more of the sun, and God could trust him now. Amen. Having been told he could never give himself to love just one other person, he had given up any hope of marriage and home. But God gave him a faithful wife and a son, who, although sacrificed for the mission field, was returned to him to carry on his work. During the test of becoming a father to the fatherless, he had to give up his fondest dream of preaching the message of the Holy Spirit around the world. Yet, he found himself a missionary in Africa. There he was given the privilege of sharing the message of Christ coming to live in a man as the only hope of glory to thousands. His success in the field opened doors for him to preach all over the English-speaking world. In 1922, while speaking, at Landod, a man pointed out the number of young people responding to God's call. He suggested they ask the Lord for a training college in Wales. It never dawned on Mr. Howells that he was to have a part in it. But as they got down to pray, the Lord said to him, Be careful how you pray, Reese. I'm going to build a college and build it through you. The Lord confirmed it through 1 Chronicles 28, 20 and 21. For these three promises stood out before him. Be strong 
and do it. For the Lord God will be with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee until thou hast finished all the work of the house of the Lord. Second, there shall be with thee every willing, skillful man for any manner of service. And the third from the next chapter, that the Lord would give him a talent of gold, which from the margin of his Schofield Bible he learned was worth 6,150 pounds, or about $300,000 today. This meant giving up travels in the worldwide revival ministry. But worse than this, it would mean that after giving up one son for Africa, they would now have to leave behind hundreds of spiritual children in Africa. The further confirmation came while visiting at Moody Bible Institute, and he asked the spirit if he could build a college like this one in Wales. And the answer was, yes, you can. Because what I'm going to do, I'm going to do through man. And you're, you're going to go tell these young people that I came to dwell in you. Can I build that college through you? Restates, when that question was asked, the college was built in that second. Living totally by faith without any wage earning, he and his wife bowed in faith with 16 shillings in their pocket and saw the Bible College of Wales completed. The property in Swansea was purchased out from under the Roman Catholic Church for the promised amount of exactly 6,150 pounds. God's College, as the press called it, opened its doors in June of 1924. It was called God's College because there was never a board of directors. No tuition <coughs> was ever charged, and students paid only half the actual cost of room and board. Although he had no money of his own, God entrusted Reese with hundreds of thousands of pounds over the years. And at the college, he had a home after all. In the cottage ministry he had turned over to another man years before, it was just a flicker compared to the flames that would be ignited by his ministry through this college. The toil of years of his own hard physical labor at the mine and physically interceding for others was over. He had become a contented vessel emptied of himself. He moved peacefully along in the strength and power of the Holy Ghost. Yes, the victim had moved to the other side of the cross. He, too, was now a resurrected victor. When Reese was deeply moved by a need, his first question to the Lord was always, what do you want me to do? When he heard the plight of missionary children having nowhere to go, when these parents were on the field, he began a home and a school for them. This was the same man who years before, during a test of faith, had raised had faced raising four orphan children. He couldn't do it. He had no heart for children. But the Lord gave him love enough, not only for them, but for the hundreds that he would be a father to throughout his life. Following the example of others who had set a goal of reaching the world for Christ, the Every Creature Commission was begun in 1934. From the time of the 1936 dedication of the commission, the Holy Spirit began moving in gradually on the believers at the college in a way never seen before. It was the Pentecost of the college. Prior to this, they were just a loosely woven group of believers meeting together. But after the Holy Spirit moved in, they become entwined with each other. In the words of Dr. Kingsley Pretty, a staff member and a future headmaster, he says, one by one, they were broken and bowed in tears and contrition before the Lord. Remember, it was one by one. This cleansing of all that was self was necessary for the difficult task ahead. He had a work to do in the world that only he could do. That our bodies were to be the temples of the Holy Ghost we knew. But when he pressed the question, who's living in your body? We could not say that he was. We had to confess that we knew nothing of the Holy Ghost as an indwelling person. In his nature, he was just like Jesus. He would never live for self, but only live for others. We were people who had left all to follow the Savior and had forsaken all we had of the world's goods to enter a life of faith. And as far as we knew, we had surrendered our lives entirely to the one who died for us. But he showed us. 
There is all the difference in the world between your surrendered life in my hands and me living my life in your body. It would be a burdensome walk to intercede for the salvation of the world. Satanic attacks would be so fierce that mere flesh and blood would never be able to hold out. Reese explains, only one person was sufficient for all these things, and he was the glorious third person of the Godhead in those whom he was able to indwell. And by his indwelling, they'd been made entirely new people, equipped and prepared by the Holy Ghost. And so it began. Intercession for world leaders and world events that would adversely affect the preaching of the gospel became the priority. According to Doris Roscoe, who lived and was on staff at the college during the time, the prayer was intense and often. I just have to interject before I read this that we would each, myself included, think about our own prayer life, how much time we spend, and then think what this man had the college doing every day. For some time after the war broke out, the evening prayer meetings had been extended from 6 p.m. till 9 p.m. <coughs> when the war began in earnest, there were two meetings every night, from 7 p.m. till 9 p.m and from 9 p.m. till midnight, and usually long after. As each crisis in the war developed, the Holy Spirit guided our prayers, and each time we knew that victory had been gained in the Spirit before the news came over the radio or in the newspapers of the victory of a field in battle. Reese had never forgotten Mr. Maurice Rubin, the converted Jew who had opened the eyes of his heart to be born again. When the burden came for the Jews, he led the college through months and years of intercession for Israel to return to their own land. He read of Jewish children being thrown out at the Polish border, and he knew God would have him do something. He made an offer on a huge estate with not a penny in his pocket. But the money came in, and it was known as the City of Refuge in Wells for Jewish refugee children. But just as the arrangements were complete, and the governments had agreed, and the children were to come, war broke out. After spending all that money on this huge estate, only 12 Jewish children were able to come. Was it all a mistake then? Had he heard God incorrectly? Even in apparent failure, whether it was the tubercular woman who had died even though the spirit had told Reese she would live, or of purchasing the estate for Jewish children who were never able to come, or predicting that there would be no war right up until that third day of September 1939 when the Nazis attacked Poland, or publicly predicting the incorrect date of the end of World War II, which brought no end to the damage to his reputation. Still, in all of this, Rees never doubted God. God used all these burdens and seeming failures to accomplish his will. And quite frankly, God is under no obligation to explain himself to any of us, is he? I remember when I was younger, I used to ask, why does God always seem to take us to China to answer a prayer next door? But through all of these trials of the war years, he had one overriding burden, and that was to see 100,000 pounds come in to support the missionaries on the field, many of whom had gone out from the college. On January 15, 1950, Reese announced that everything in me is praising God because the Holy Ghost can say, I have finished the work thou gavest me to do. Every creature will hear the gospel. The finance for the vision is safe and the king will come back. He had the assurance that God would give the promised $100,000, about $3 million today, which he would then invest in his work as seeds of faith. And then, after investing the 100,000 pounds, he would claim the hundredfold for fulfilling the Every Creature Commission. It was to be the completion of the earthly warfare of the Lord's intercessor. Within a month, he was face to face with his Savior. Two years before, while on a remembrance visit to Landod Wells, where he had had his meeting with the Holy Spirit so long ago, he had suffered a heart attack. 
No one ever knew how much he endured in his body from then on, preferring as always to let all things to the Lord. He would take no medication or rest. He remained consumed with his passion and prayer for the kingdom and the dying souls of men. And he would continue to preside over those long prayer meetings. On February 7th, the matron of the college hospital was burdened to check on him. He was pacing up and down the room singing some of the old Welsh hymns his mother used to sing of the land that is fairer than day. February 8th, he suffered a heart attack. During the next four days, during times of consciousness, the names of some missionaries, especially Mr. Norman Grubb, and Mr. John Thomas, and other intimate friends could be heard in his prayers. He never breathed one word about his pain, but said, it's the Lord, it's the Lord. I'm in the center of the Lord's will, everything is gained. It's the Lord. On February 12, 1950, he breathed in a quiet whisper, victory, hallelujah, and to his wife, glorious victory. Reese Howell's earthly life was over. <clears throat> Just like Jesus, his life and ministry had been limited to a geographical area. But as Jesus told his disciples, when I leave and the Holy Spirit comes, your works will be unlimited. Only the limits on Reese Howell's work ended on February 12, 1950. God unlimited carries it on. Without experiencing this with Reese Howells and through his eyes, I honestly believe I would not have had the open door to introduce life in union with Christ to my church family. Amen. Norman Grubb has so artfully outlined the working of the Holy Spirit and the struggle to comprehend it in this man's life that he literally pulls us spiritually self-satisfied believers through the knothole with him. I'm nearing the end of teaching Reese Howell's life for the second time. Along with several deacons and other church leaders, as well as several who are repeating the class, I realize that we too have been privileged to know this man intimately. You cannot meet this man and not be impacted by his life. And so I find myself taking my place beside those who knelt at the bedside of Reese Howell's and breathe with them their prayer, I will be done. And I, too, ask the Lord to make us worthy successors of such a noble servant of our <coughs> Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.